Angiogenesis. I'm saying that right? Angiogenesis. Angiogenesis. God, that one start tough for me. Hello, everyone. I'm Morgan, co-founder of Primal Kitchen and host of the Primal Kitchen podcast. Today, I'm honored to sit down with a world-renowned physician, scientist, speaker, and author, Dr. William Lee. He's best known for his book, Eat to Beat Disease, and his work leading the Angiogenesis Foundation. His groundbreaking work has impacted more than 70 diseases, including cancer, diabetes, blindness, heart disease, and obesity. Dr. Lee has a viral TED Talk called Can We Eat to Starve Cancer, which has garnered more than 11 million views. An author of over 100 scientific publications in leading journals, Dr. Lee has served on the faculties of Harvard, Dartmouth, and Tufts University. Before we get started, a brief reminder that any and all opinions and views shared by hosts and guests on this podcast are the speaker's own and do not represent the view of Primal Kitchen or its affiliates or parent company. Hello, Dr. Lee. Welcome. Hi, Morgan. Great to be on with you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. I have personally been always just obsessed with research on how to prevent and treat cancer as it pertains to diet. So I'm I'm particularly interested to get into that. But before we do, how did you how did you get here? How did you know you wanted to be a physician and and then enter into this particular study? You know, I've always been uh, interested in becoming a doctor. Uh, um, but became before I became a doctor, I actually was very interested in food. And, uh, and that intersection between food and health is something that interested me uh, even when I was in college. And, uh, uh, you know, and I was particularly fascinated by the Mediterranean and, and Asia. Uh, so I actually took a gap year before I went to medical school specifically to embed myself in those areas of the world and study the links between food, the culture, and the health that people were actually um, pursuing and enjoying. Yeah, in those areas, usually use, using on a traditional, uh, traditional kind of uh, eating uh, patterns. Um, but, you know, so I'm an internal medicine doctor. I'm an MD. I'm trained uh, to take care of men and women, young and old, healthy and sick. But my philosophy has always been, if, you know, you should try to stay healthy. I should try to help people stay healthy. But, you know, over the course of your life, you're going to, a few people are going to fall off, slide off that roof. And my job is to get you back up on the roofs of health so you can continue to um, be on your way uh, to enjoy the rest of your life. And that's very different than I think I was trained as a doctor to do, which is to diagnose disease, um, uh, you know, chase the disease with medications or take or procedures or specialists. And you keep on doing that ad infinitum. And for my, for something that really always was important to me is how do you get, keep people at health uh, healthy and how do you get people back to health? I'm also a researcher. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm what they call a vascular biologist, which means I study blood vessels and I run the angiogenesis foundation, which is really focusing on using, uh, studying blood vessels for health. And, uh, one of the things that we did in my organization is to look for common denominators, wa- ways to actually uh, treat diseases like cancer and diabetes and heart disease and blindness. And we felt that if we could pull the bow back and send a single arrow through a common disease, a common denominator, we can be a lot more effective that way. And so in fact, um, I've been involved with 41, soon to be 42 FDA approved treatments for cancer, diabetes, diabetes complications and, and blindness, vision loss. Um, but along the way, one of the sort of uh, 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 light bulb moments for me was realizing that um, treating disease as important that it, as that is for sick people uh, is falls short of the goal of preventing disease itself. And if you're going to do prevention, you really can't be thinking about drugs or, or biotechnologies. You're going to be talking about something that's safe, you know, readily available, um, something that people can get behind. And that's where food comes in. And what I realized is that I had developed all of these uh, 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 systems to study drugs. And here was the opportunity to be able to study food in those same systems. So I'm actually one of the people doing food as medicine research. And the whole goal is to be able to get to that next level where we're not, uh, we're not uh, guessing what might be happening uh, with food in the body, but we're actually generating the data and studying it in ways that we can actually trust and count on. Super cool. Okay, backing up, where'd you go on your gap here? Where you uh, well, I, you know, so uh, one of my most impactful courses I took in college was about the Renaissance. Uh, it was on Renaissance Images of Man. And uh, what I learned in that course uh, was that 
there was the dark ages, the middle ages, and then there was sort of the Renaissance, which was kind of a golden age of science and arts and foods and everything else. And that it didn't happen overnight. That it wasn't like one day you were in a dark room and then one day somebody turned on the lights and suddenly you had astronomy and you actually had, well, I mean, it wasn't, wasn't that way at all, but it was this continuum. And I realized that at any moment in time, we, uh, like, like you and me right now, Morgan, we are in this year, this time right now, and behind us is the past that, and in front of us is the future. And one day, what we're, uh, what we just stepped out of from, from yesterday is going to be the distant past is going to be um, viewed as kind of a dark ages. And so what I was always interested in is what's the best of the past that you can take into the future? And then how do you create a better future with the tools that the new tools that you're going to have? And so I went to Italy. I was in Northern wow. Italy. I traveled all around. I was interested in studying the food, uh, the culture, uh, health, how people stayed healthy. And I have to say, you know, when people talk about the Mediterranean diet today, they're not talking about them. Uh, you know, they're often just hand waving and saying, you know, uh, food in, in the Mediterranean is healthy, but we're really not. But what I was interested in was traditional Mediterranean eating, which is not what is eaten in the Mediterranean today. I mean, today in the Mediterranean, most people eat the same stuff that they, that we in America more or less. So I was interested in traditional eating patterns. I went to Greece and I actually studied, uh, I went to a place in the North uh, East corner of Greece called Mount Athos that actually lives a medieval lifestyle. And I was interested in cooking in these monastic kitchens. It was amazing cooking, cooking legumes like beans uh, in a gigantic cauldron with a, a, a ladle, a spoon, the size of a canoe paddle, um, wow. you know, but just to really appreciate, you know, uh, that the fact is that, you know, not everybody had a microwave, a sous vide machine, you know, like yeah. <clears throat> there, there are traditional ways of doing things. And I was always interested in understanding how breaking things down to the basics yeah. and the basics actually allow us to really study how the body works on an elemental level. Very cool. I love it. Um, so you become a physician, then you get into this field and what are, like, what are, how would you summarize your work or I guess your book, Eat to Beat Disease? Like, what do people need to know? You know, uh, I, I think, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, listen, I, 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 I've given a lot of thought to that because I think like a lot of people that are watching and listening, uh, I, I started out the same as everyone else. Like I, I, I wanted to be healthy. Uh, uh, and I had, a, I was scratching my head to try to figure out, well, what does that mean? You know, do I work out? Do I get a trainer? Do I, you know, go on a, a, a diet? You know, wh what do I do? And, and I realized because I'm a physician and a scientist that the definition of health wasn't that clear, right? So most people think, uh, uh are you healthy? Yes. How do you know? Because I don't, I'm not sick. So health being the absence of disease as a definition is not really very satisfactory because you can't do anything proactively about the about a negative space you know the the absence of something doesn't allow you to do something to keep it absent and so for me i was i, I put my 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 kind of like my research hat on and figured out that health is not just the absence of disease it's actually the result of our body's own hardwired health defense systems that we're born with that are formed when we were in our mom's wombs. And we were the moment we were born, these health defense systems were firing in all cylinders to keep our body healthy. Like from the day we're born to our very last breath, these health defenses um, are doing a job to make, make sure all the functions are moving smoothly. It's kind of like the operating system uh, of your laptop, your computer. And until our very last breath, they're still at work. And so what we put into our body can either take down and uh, diminish or uh, or break down our, uh, our our defenses. So imagine pouring spilling water on your laptop. You can kind of screw it up um, or dropping it. Or what you can actually do is we what we put into our body can actually build up support and activate our health defenses. So we become healthier. Now operationally, we have something we can do. We have a definition of health. It comes from the body. These pathways and uh, there's some mechanics for our health and the things that we choose to eat can activate them. That's the good news. Very cool. And so the diet, like if you, you know, what would you prescribe to them? Like, what are the key tenets of eating for health? 
Yeah, so um, again, I, I started out like many people um, wondering, well, what's the best superfood? Right. You know, is there one superfood or super supplement? And I'll tell you what my research found very quickly is that there's no single superfood or super supplement. Um, it's really the human body that's really super, like pretty ph phenomenal, actually, because, you know, some people who get cancer, for example, say, well, why did I get cancer? What did you scratch your head? Is it genetics? Is it something I, yeah. I had contact with? Actually, I turned the question around to say a more interesting question is, why don't we get sick more often? Like, how is it that we're actually not sick all the time? We're bombarded by viruses and bacteria in the air. We're actually outdoors. Um, you know, even if you're not getting sunburned at the beach, you're sitting in traffic with the sun blazing on your face through the windshield. How come you don't get skin cancer doing that? You know, um, we've got radon coming up under our feet from the ground. We've got off gassing from our carpet, and our new furniture. How come we don't get sick more often? It's because of our health defenses. So when it comes to food, um, I've done a decade worth of research to really try to figure out what foods activate our health defenses. And of course, which foods actually take them down. I think it's a much more interesting question of what we can add to our body to build itself up. And it basically falls into the categories that, um, that we've come to know. So mostly plant-based foods activate our health defenses, fruits, vegetables, legumes, healthy, healthy oils, fats, um, uh, seeds uh, are good for us. Um, uh, seafoods, uh, contain omega-3s, which ultimately come back from plants because the fish eat them uh, uh, from a plant-based source. Uh, so uh, at the end of the day, it is kind of a plant-based uh, kind of um, concept. Uh, beverages like coffee and tea, uh, all plant-based, uh, even hot cocoa. Uh, the cocoa pod actually is, is, is a plant. And so those are some of the building blocks for, uh, I would say, dietary eating, eating patterns uh, some of which are found in many traditional cultures. Remember I told you I went to the Mediterranean um, and I also spent time in Asia. And if you take a look at that, most of those traditional eating patterns were primarily plant-based um, uh, as well. And so when you eat these foods, you're getting the natural chemicals that mother nature imbued in foods. And those natural chemicals often help the plant survive. You know, like what's in a tomato or what's in a carrot or what's in a, a, a grape. Uh, but when, when we eat those foods, those chemicals that are naturally in the plant to protect the plant have another job description, which is that they interact with our body's health defenses and they help our body remain even healthier. Yeah, I like that switch into, there's so much focus in like diet and health on like what you need to avoid and what you need to restrict. And it's, it just gets nauseating. So it's like nice to be able to think about like, what can I do actually that will focus on the positive instead of focusing so much on the negative. I feel like we're yeah. bombarded with that information. Yeah. And you know, the, the other thing I'll tell you, Morgan, is that I, I'm somebody who appreciates food. I love the taste of food. Yeah. I wouldn't say that I love eating, like I don't gorge, but I really appreciate the fact that food tastes great. And there's all these uh, interesting cultural and creative aspects to food that's developed over centuries. Um, and so uh, my mantra, my personal mantra as a physician, as a scientist who works in food and health is that you should love your food to love your health. So find those foods that you already like that are good for you and do more, eat more of that uh, yeah. and make sure you're aligning your own preferences and desires with something that's healthy. Yeah, we have that big, we have that philosophy too. Like, don't be eating stuff if you don't love it. What's the point? I mean, yeah. Because you're not, because you're not going to, you're not going to stick with it. Yeah, I, to I totally agree. Okay. Angiogenesis. I'm saying that right? Angiogenesis. Angiogenesis. God, that one's tough for me. What is this? What do we need to know about this? This is like not something I'm familiar with at all, but I'm very curious. Right. Well, you know, um, uh, angiogenesis is a fancy Greek word that you can break down. Angio, blood or blood vessels. Genesis, creation of. And so angiogenesis is simply the way our bodies grow blood vessels. Now, our blood vessels are incredibly important for our health for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's a lot of them. We all have 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels packed inside our body. And we know that they're everywhere because if you cut yourself anywhere in your skin, your forehead, your arm, your knee, you're gonna bleed. And those blood vessels are packed right down to the bone. And in fact, we even have blood vessels inside our bones. So if you imagine these are the highways and byways through which uh, our body 
brings blood to every cell and every organ in our body. The air we breathe, the quality of the air we breathe, gets transferred as oxygen to our cells. The food we eat, the micronutrients that come out of our food get absorbed into our bloodstream. That's how it's get brought to our cells and our organs. So when our blood vessels are healthy, we're healthy. And when our blood vessels are sick, now we know that clogging blood vessels, you know, leads to heart attack and stroke and other bad things, but we can also have problems with blood vessels where you don't have enough of them or you have too many of them. And so the body defends our circulation by making sure that everywhere in our body, we have just the right number of blood vessels, not too little, not too few, not too many. It's kind of, I call it the Goldilocks zone. So it's kind of like the three bears, not too hard, not too soft, not yeah. too hot, not too cold. Same thing as blood vessels, not too many, not too few, just the right amount. And that is actually one of the central tenets to health. What does that have to do with uh, nutrition besides the fact that all the nutrients have to go through the tubes of the blood vessels? Well, it turns out that certain foods can help uh, our body from overgrowing blood vessels. So blood vessels, if they overgrow, can feed diseases. So we need to be able to mow down those extra blood vessels. So think about a landscaper coming in to mow the lawn. You got you know, the two, grass is too tall, but you want to get it the right height, mow it. And the body can do that, but foods can help us do that even better. Now, why is that important? Because cancers are forming all the time in our bodies. And, and you know, like all of us watching this, we all have cancer in our body right now. I got cancer in my body right now because we're all made of 40 trillion cells that are dividing like crazy to, to make more of us, keep us alive. And all it takes is one or two mistakes to occur when the cells are dividing and presto, you have a microscopic cancer. This microscopic cancer will never hurt you, will never kill you. Um, it stays that size because it doesn't have a blood supply. It doesn't have enough to eat or drink or nourish itself. So it cannot grow larger than the size of the tip of a ballpoint pen. It's about two millimeters in diameter. And it'll stay there until your immune system, which is another health defense system, wings by like a cop on a beat, seeing some drug dealers on a corner and basically says, hey, you're not supposed to be here. Get in the back and take some away. And that's basically what our immune system does, spot these little microscopic cancers and then gets rid of them. So our body's ability, our health defenses to prevent angiogenesis from growing into tumors is excess blood vessels, really, really important. By the way, I've done research to show to, that we know for a fact that that little microscopic harmless uh, cancer, two millimeters in diameter, uh, if you allow blood vessels to grow to it, so let's say it releases its own fertilizers and blood vessels grow to it, that overage of blood vessels, the moment a blood vessel starts feeding a cancer, bringing oxygen and nutrients, that cancer is able to expand. And in fact, research has shown that a cancer can expand 16,000 times in two weeks Sad. once blood vessels grow to it. So it's like a trigger on a gun to explode cancer growth. So foods that we eat can actually help our body restrict those blood vessels. I can starve can We can eat to starve the cancer by cutting off its blood supply. Green tea, as an example. Uh, 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 some of uh, 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 leafy green vegetables, uh, tomatoes, uh, mushrooms are just legumes. Some examples of foods that actually have natural um, uh, lawn mowing, cancer starving, anti-abnormal angiogenesis properties. Interesting. So that to me sounds like something that would just happen so easily this shotgun blood vessel feeding cancer cell thing, like how frequent is that, that results in like a cancer diagnosis or some sort of cancer that might be growing that could, is actually harmful, but you may you, have, may or may not have found it yet or. That's right. Well, so basically if you let these bl blood vessels that continue to grow into the cancer, what is invisible, like a pimple will start to turn into a boil and then it'll get really, and then it'll turn to a bowling ball. And by the time we diagnose cancer, usually uh, the cancers are quite large and sometimes they've spread already. Uh, so the, the name of the game for cancer prevention is to intercept these little tiny microscopic cancers. So, they, so then your immune system can basically dry erase and wipe them out, wipe them out of your body. That's, that's the immune defense. So this angiogenesis defense system and the immune defense system work hand in hand. Interesting. And so when you say eat to starve cancer, is there any like a fasting? I feel like there's a lot of research coming out on like fasting and autophagy. Does any of that play in? Are you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So again, you know, I, I'm, 
I'm a scientist, so I kind of go wherever the evidence is. And what's yeah. really cool is that lots of research is being done looking uh, at how tumors and blood vessels interact with one another. So, so a caloric restriction, fasting is just one practice to do that, actually will start to cut off the blood supply feeding cancers. It's so the natural ability when you restrict uh, your caloric intake to be able to prevent tumors from growing blood vessels. Wow. Cool. So you can eat or you can not eat to starve cancer, it sounds like. Well, you can eat foods that you like that can actually starve cancer. Yeah. But but if you do that, the key is not to eat too much. So this isn't really, you know, starving a cancer doesn't mean starving yourself. So you don't have to go on to go get lost in the desert in order to be able to do something good for yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And some of your favorite foods, you mentioned green tea. I'm a matcha drinker. Primal Kitchen has this amazing matcha latte drink that I'm obsessed with. But so that I was happy to hear that. But what are some of the other like favorite? Oh, man. Well, so, you know, um, I love foods that I call grand slammer foods. Okay. These grand slammer foods hit all five of the health defense systems. Androgenesis, our stem cells that help us regenerate uh, from the inside out our gut microbiome, which is so important for our health, our DNA's ability to protect itself and slow cellular aging, and also our immune system, which everybody knows you can lower inflammation and boost your immunity to protect yourself all at the same time. So I like foods that can do a lot of these different functions at the same time. So some of the foods, for example, are uh, in addition to green tea, dark chocolate can actually do it. The cacao bean. I don't know if you've ever seen a cacao bean. I actually ordered um, some fresh cacao beans from Florida, uh, not too long ago. And they came in a box and they were these beautiful football shaped and sized yeah. beans. And, um, uh, and they're pretty hard. Like you could throw it like a football actually, but if you cut it in half, what's inside there is it's kind of like a surprise. They're, um, these little nuts seeds, the size of about a small chestnut. And they're covered with a little pericarp, which is kind of the fruit it looks like a lychee. And when you eat it, it's kind of sweet and sour, like a little bit. It's, it tastes really great. Um, uh, and then those seeds are dried, fermented, and then crushed. <clears throat> That's how you make cacao. So dark chocolate, like 85% or higher, like that can be made, uh, into, uh, uh, into foods in different kinds of foods, whether it's a mole sauce or a hot chocolate or, you know, or, or, uh, or, or actually chocolate, dark yeah. chocolate that actually will, uh, hit all five of your health defense systems. That's the second one I like. I like berries blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, um, they stimulate the immune system. They, uh, they cut off the blood supply to feed, uh, feeding cancers. They can really address all kinds of aspects of our health. Tree nuts, I love macadamias, pistachios, walnuts. Tree nuts is a category, good healthy fiber for the gut microbiome. When the bio microbiome, your gut bacteria are healthy, they talk to the immune system and make your immune system healthier. Um, nuts have been shown to actually um, also reduce your risk and improve outcomes uh, for cancer, which is really quite amazing. So uh, I really enjoy that. And I'm a coffee drinker. I actually like coffee. Coffee has a natural bioactive called chlorogenic acid and chlorogenic acid uh, remarkably um, uh, actually hits all five of the health defense systems. So a cup of Joe in the morning, not only kind of is a good wake up, pick me up, wake, wake up, uh, uh, pick me up later in the day, but it actually, actually has all these, uh, a, a great uh, 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 health benefits through the chlorogenic acid. Now, little kind of uh, uh, pro tip uh, for both tea and coffee is to try not to use, if you want the good stuff, the chlorogenic acid, try not to use, add dairy to it because the fat in dairy actually forms little soap bubbles around the chlorogenic acid and tea around the catechins that are good. And those soap bubbles, when you drink it, actually, prevent your body from absorbing it. So then the soap bubble just kind of rolls through your system. You only get, to, you only absorb about 20% uh, that way. And so you're missing out on like the, the, the big punch of what you're looking for, a, a big slug of health. If you, nut milks are fine, by the way, it's just dairy. That's, that was going to be my ask. Yeah. Yeah. Nut, nut milks are fine. It, you sort of like cut down on dairy. So, you know, if you want to use, if you want something to kind of mellow out your coffee or tea, use a nut milk. Mm -hmm. I just got an almond cow for Christmas for my mom and I am obsessed with now making my own nut milk. I'm sick of all these like Tetra packs and plastic packaging in my house. So I thought that was an easy way we could eliminate some shout out for almond cow. Um, very cool. Okay. I love those. 
So does any of your research get into, like, say you get into the, you have active cancer you're treating, like, do you, do you deal there as well? Or are you more focused on the prevention? No, I'm at, you know, cause I, I, I'm very agnostic to figuring out, like, I, I want, I want there to be something, food is a tool in a toolbox for almost any situation. So, and this is something that I've experienced myself, um, you know, as a doctor, people that have cancer always used to ask me after the diagnosis, Hey doc, what's the chemo I've got to take, or what's the treatment I have surgery I got to do, who's the specialist I need to see, or the radiation. And, and then at the end of the day, they would get up and put their coat on and walk out my office. And then all of a sudden they pop back in with their, their head would pop back and say, one more thing, doc, what should I be eating for my, what can I do for myself? And I realized that I was never taught that in medical school. Yeah. And I thought that that was just wrong. And that was a big um, uh, stimulus, uh, a wake up moment for me to really decide to go back and to dive into nutrition, not as a dietitian and not as a nutritionist. I think that those professionals do an amazing job with what they're trained to do. I wanted to approach it really as a physician, which is, all right, what foods do we need that can actually help us not only prevent, but to treat disease? And many of the same foods that activate our health defenses are the way that we can use food as tool in the toolbox. And here's a couple of examples. A study of 800, more than 800 patients with stage three colon cancer, getting regular old treatment, whatever treatment they're getting, um, were, were studied and, they, and it was 800 patients. And it was found that those people who actually had two handfuls of tree nuts, okay, uh, a week, easily achievable, had a 50% decrease in mortality. That is quite insane. amazing. I mean, that's like got to be better numbers than some of the cancer, the farmer. Well, this is. Well, this, well, this is actually, this is adding to the pharmaceutical. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Now, there's a, and a, another study was published just last week showing in 200 some patients with me melanoma, okay, that had a very a deadly form of melanoma, yeah. that if they were getting immunotherapy, which requires your, your immune system to work really well, that if they, the people who would respond had one healthy gut bacteria in their um, gut called ruminococcus, and the people who had that healthy gut bacteria or eating dietary fiber, fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, that dietary fiber, they even calculated it. For every five grams of dietary fiber, that's the amount of fiber that you would have in an average size pair. It would reduce mortality in this study by 30%. What? These are big numbers. And by the way, yeah. this is published in the journal of science. These are not like woo-woo yeah. journals or studies. These are like serious journals. And this study was in fact, done by the MD Anderson Cancer Center and the National Institutes of Health. Wow. So like, this is like a no holds barred research. And this is where this field of food as medicine is going. And I'm one of the people, you know, sort of who started to crack open the, this new way. Food as medicine, by the way, is an ancient idea. Of course. It goes back thousands of years. Um, what we have, and you know, because back then there was no, there were no medicines. Food was the only thing we had to put into our body that would actually either take down our health or build it back up. And people knew that, but today, you know, we now have science on our side. So some of the, so some of the things that we were talking about and all of my work is based on science, which then generates the evidence. And science is like uh, building a brick wall. Every research study you do, every result is another brick in the wall and it builds on the last one and it sets up for the next level you go. And so that's really what we're, where we're going today. And that's what I write about in my book, Eat to Beat Disease, so I teach about in my master classes. We want to actually um, help people understand that we are now putting into the past, you know, this idea that we don't know much about our diet and it's all contradictory and it's mostly confusing. So you throw your hands up and say, I don't, I don't think I'm going to do anything because that doesn't really matter anyway. It does matter. And now we have evidence to begin to show what matters and why. Very cool. Um, what's your master class? Ah, well, so um, my master class is a free class I do every other month, and people can find it on my website, drwilliamlee.com, drwilliamli.com. And I started to teach a free master class, uh, which is an online Zoom kind of thing, because during the initial lockdown of the pandemic, I was staring out the window like the rest of humanity, right? right? What was going to happen? What was going on? How, you know, what, the, what was the future going to hold? And I realized that, ironically, here I am a doctor, and um, I realized that nobody could depend on 
the medical system. Hospitals couldn't help us. Doctors couldn't help us. We didn't have any drugs. We didn't have any vaccines. We didn't have enough knowledge about the disease. So there was nothing that the medical system could do. But every single person, myself included, had to go eat. And so I realized that here was information, my own work, about how to eat to beat disease, how to eat to shore up your health. It was a one thing that we could all do during sort of this global uh, problem and people didn't know about it. So I decided to start going online and recruiting people to say, hey, if you're interested in your health and you wanna know what you can do, you and only you can do that your doctor can't do for you, that's based on science that you can trust, um, that, that is exciting and positive, and that actually puts you in the driver's seat and involves things that you actually like to eat, please, you know, I'm gonna hold these master classes and it's been phenomenally successful. One of my master, recent master classes, we had 8,000 people from 38 countries sign on board um, uh, at the same time. And so what I feel is so rewarding is knowing that there's information out there that people can use that they really, really want. So I encourage everybody to come sign up from a master class. Very cool. And you're, do all these interesting studies that you just mentioned previously, are they all in your book, Eat to Beat Disease? Like, and I'm missing oh, yeah. any more yeah, of those. I mean, so. Oh yeah, so, so if, so if you, if you, uh, you know, uh, if you want to get tables and charts uh, and, and doses of foods that you need, I, uh, I write about more than 200 different foods I've done research on in Eat to Beat Disease. And there's more that's even going to be, uh, that, that I've more research I've done, obviously, since the book came out. And so, you know, this is where, if you sign on for my newsletter, I'm talking about new foods that we're discovering uh, all the time that are uh, uh, interesting. And here's the really amazing uh, thing that, you know, I get up and I feel good about my work every day, Morgan, which is that the foods that are being discovered to be beneficial are ones that taste good. You know, um, yeah. uh, I, I tell people, you know, like, uh, some people would say, you know, like, ah, oh, man, Dr. Lee, there's, I, I don't like healthy food at all, you know? And, and I basically said, here, I, I hold up my book and I say, here's a, here's a Sharpie, circle uh, in the charts uh, of 200 foods, all the foods that you like. And they'll sit there pretty soon. They start circling lots of foods, right? I, I haven't met anybody who couldn't circle at least 10 foods. Yeah. And then I show it to them and I say, look, here, this is great news because you circle foods that you like that activate your health defenses, you already said that you like them. So you are already ahead of the game. So let's go ahead and start with these. And then we can start exploring more foods for you to kind of uh, uh, see if you like them and, 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 uh, and uh, explore and, and find ways to incorporate them into your life. These days, Morgan, you know, there's no excuse um, uh, not to be able to uh, find something interesting and fun to do with any ingredient, literally. It's like something you don't recognize. You know, obviously in my book, we've got the pears and the walnuts and all bits of coffee and all that kind of stuff. But what happens if you come up with something in my, my book, like a Grand Slammer, is squid ink. Now, you may know what squid ink is. I, I certainly know what it is. I, I like to cook with it. But let's say you don't know what it is. All you got to do is pick up your, 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 your phone and search on Google, squid ink, recipe, video, and bang, you'll actually find people in five minute videos who's teaching you how to make something tasty and showing you how to do it. Squid ink is one of your, your heavy hitters. Yeah. Talk more about that. So interesting. Okay. So um, uh, uh, squid are animals that swim in the sea. They, uh, uh, squid, cuttlefish, octopus, when they are threatened, they actually release this cloud of ink. Right. Uh, I think every, every kid has heard about it or seen yeah. it. It's a kind of a cool thing to actually see. And then in this cloud of ink, like in the smoke screen, the, the squid will then zip away, jet away, and it's escaped this predator. So the ink is actually a delicacy. I discovered this in my, in my gap year. You know, um, I went to places like Venice. Um, and then subsequently, I've been to Spain and other places. And the little ink sacks actually um, have liquid in it. And you can cook with this liquid. And it is jet black. I mean, it, it is like it is like acrylic ink, jet black. It's kind of really unusual. I think it's an absolutely fantastic, delicious taste. It's a little briny. It 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 gives this uh, amazing flavor. And so in in Venice, they cook rice with it. You get this incredible black rice. You serve with golden polenta, uh, which is made out of a grain. Uh, you um, you uh, can make pasta out of it. So 
most people have actually seen on a restaurant menu, black pasta. Yeah, it's actually made out of, pasta. yeah of course, yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, technically it's not from squid. Technically what you see in the restaurants are usually from cuttlefish Got because it. squids are pretty small, cuttlefish are bigger. But it turns out that researchers have gone in there and, uh, and discovered that this ingredient that's part of a squid or cuttlefish that shouldn't be thrown away, right? So it's all part of be more sustainable with oh, the yeah. food. I love this using the whole um, animal. This is like the organ. This is like the organ meat of the squid. Yeah, it's an organ liquid. It's the escape. It's the escape liquid. Actually, can uh, has an anti-angiogenic property, so it actually can cut off the blood supply feeding tumors. Number one. Number two. Uh, when you test it in the lab, it protects stem cells, which we need to be protected as we age. Our stem cells actually start to slow down. About fifty percent of them slow down. Um, just as we age and our stem cells rebuild our bodies from the inside out. That's why our hair regrows and our skin looks good. Um, uh, we got all this and our organs regenerate from the inside out. Squid ink uh, actually protects our stem cells from, from, uh, from all the harms and forces that might damage stem cells. Squid ink also uh, help, is helpful for gut bacteria, it's antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties. And there've been some studies that oddly show that squid ink actually can help to elevate your immune system as well, boost immunity. So, uh, you know, I always tell people, if you want to know the science behind it, I'm happy to tell you, all, all you need to know is it tastes great. Give it a shot if you haven't had it, it and, and make sure you're tasting it, you know, with somebody who knows what to do with it. Okay. I love it. That's great. Um, a few rapid fire questions for you, but I, one, so, you know, I lived in LA for nine years, so pretty much like deathly afraid of gluten at this point, but what's your take on sourdough bread? Okay. Look, uh, many people have gluten intolerances and they should stay away from things like, you know, the whole grains that actually contain gluten and find an alternative. Um, some people, a smaller fraction actually have celiac disease, which is an autoimmune disease. Of course. Um, and, and, and gluten intolerance and autoimmunity, it's probably on a spectrum. So you can be a little intolerant or you can be very intolerant. And this all has to do with inflammation and in the immune system where um, your immune system, your health defense system is not doing what it is supposed to do. So for those people who, you know, don't feel so good or feel frankly bad eating bread or pasta or those kinds of things with, with uh, gluten, definitely adjust your diet. Uh, so, so you stay away from the things that don't make you feel good. Listen to your body is a very important uh, rule of thumb when it comes to food and health. That said, so, some people actually can tolerate gluten um, and, and they eat it. And bread has, by the way, been a staple food for thousands of years. It's yeah. one of the first uh, 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 kind of like uh, uh, foods that could be made uh, and kept for a period of time. Uh, uh, and so sourdough is one of the oldest breads in the world. And if you like sourdough bread, it's got this slightly tangy uh, taste to it. That tanginess comes from an acid called lactic acid. The lactic acid is made from a bacteria called lactobacillus ruteri. Now, lactobacillus um, uh, actually is a normal, healthy gut bacteria. So somewhere in the last thousand years, somebody figured out how to find a healthy gut bacteria and put it into the, um, uh, the bread uh, mixer, uh, the starter mix, to actually make sourdough bread. And so that, the, that bacteria kicks out the lactic acid. Now you get the, sour, the classic sourdough bread. Here's a key thing. Um, uh, you can have probiotics that actually are lactobacillus. That, the lactobacillus yeah, that's like ruteri. the most common probiotic strain that's in most off-shelf. Well, it's, well, lactobacillus is, but ruteri is a very specific. Got it. Okay. Uh, now, re I've done research on lactobacillus ruteri with uh, my colleagues at MIT, and it's really quite amazing. We showed that lactobacillus ruteri um, uh, 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 could actually speed up wound healing. So if you cut yourself, it'll heal, speed up healing. In fact, when we actually said in the lab, it doubled the rate of wound healing, which is like, unthinkable like yeah. you, there's no there's no band-aid there's no no magic uh, there's no uh, you can't put like a goop on your from the drugstore on your uh, on your on your uh, hand a cut in your hand to make it heal twice as fast gut bacteria can do it quite amazing we've also uh, looked at research data that shows that lactobacillus ruteri can amp up your immune system to fight breast cancer and colon cancer and colon polyps even which is really quite amazing and so, um, oh, in the lactobacillus ruteri, uh, in your gut, I'm talking about gut bacteria, not sourdough bread. That, that gut bacteria actually communicates to your brain and helps your brain to release social hormones like oxytocin. So oxytocin is the hormone your brain naturally secretes um, when you see a friend 
that you like when you give when you get a hug, a kiss, and and your brain floods out oxytocin during orgasm. So it, it, this is and this is all controlled um, uh, in part by this one gut bacteria. So here's the interesting tidbit about sourdough bread. So if you if you if you can tolerate bread um, uh, and you're not gluten intolerant and you like sourdough, here's a fact about the stuff that makes the sourdough bread tangy. So, but one of the questions that's asked is, now, wait a minute, bread is baked in the oven, like 400 degrees. So doesn't that kill the bacteria? So wouldn't that actually just negate anything good? Well, here's the amazing thing. From research that's been done, they've taken this lactobacillus ruderae and they've pulverized it, okay? Using an ultrasound into millions of little fragments. So the bacteria is dead, but those fragments, which you would find in sourdough bread, still do the good stuff. Oh, so you don't need live bacteria uh, to do this. Even wow. fragments of the bacteria can, are being helpful. Interesting. I love it. Okay. No, we only have a few minutes left. So I want to ask you a few questions. What does a day in the life look like for your diet? Right. Well, you know, I always get asked this question, like, what do you eat, Dr. Lee? It's really how I eat. So I get up in the morning and I will generally have uh, a cup of black coffee. I like espresso. I like strong coffee. Um, I'm choosing organic coffee because I saw some research recently to show that um, the chlorogenic acid is always higher in organic coffee because when bugs nibble on the leaves and stems of plants, the uh, plants respond to it as a wound and pump more of the good stuff into uh, the, the, the bean. Um, I will have fruit and I try to eat seasonal fruits uh, and I don't eat too much of them, but I, I like berries in the summer, I'll have a pear in the winter, or citrus in the winter, uh, or an apple. Uh, so whatever is actually seasonal, whatever I can find, local growers, um, by what I find in the market, I'll actually have some fruit. Um, uh, you know, I, I tend to eat light for lunch, uh, and um, I'll, 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 sometimes I'll have leftovers from dinner. Uh, but but uh, so I always think about that when I'm actually cooking dinner. Can I make something yeah. healthy and tasty for dinner that I can actually save some time and eat again as leftovers the next day? Sometimes I'll spike it up with some spices. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll sometimes have a salad. Uh, and then dinner, I try to make it more of my kind of centerpiece. Uh, I, I, I start with something really, really tasty. Um, but I, I, I'm a, I don't have a lot of time. And so I want to make sure that something's healthy and tasty, relatively simple too. Uh, something I did uh, not too long ago, um, I, I, I cooked on television to show people how easy it is to make something t delicious. I um, took a can of sardines uh, that actually have are, are low in the food chain, have a lot of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and I showed how you could actually make a quick salad um, uh, uh, or and some quick greens. You could take chard or kale. You can quickly saute them with a little garlic, olive oil, a squeeze of lemon. And then literally you open up the can and you just break up the sardines in there and you can mix it together. You could put that, you could just serve that as a, as a dish. I did a risotto out of it. I can make a pasta out of it. Simple things. I, you know, I and I, I will often go to the list that's in my book and pick out a star ingredient that I want to actually center around my dinner. But what I do is I always try to center my meal uh, and choose to put onto my plate first something that's plant-based that I know is going to be good for me. So, you know, when we all grew up, right, in America, what do you do? You think about the protein. Right. We're we going to do beef. Are we going to do pork? Are we going to do chicken? Are we going to do fish? And then you make a, you know, like it, it's a sign of prosperity to have a big chunk of that on your plate. And then all the, and the vegetables are kind of the garnish or the sides. I think about the vegetables, the main and anything else as really sides or garnishes to it. I like it. Sounds great. Sounds delicious. Um, okay. What are you most excited about in health and wellness these days? Well, I think that um, what's really great is there's so many foods that we're now realizing can lower inflammation on one hand, and inflammation being the, one of the root problems of chronic diseases like diabetes and obesity and heart disease and, and even dementia. So the, there's more of these anti-inflammatory properties to foods, but at the same time, and this is what's exciting, many of these foods can also boost our immune system to protect us against bacteria and viruses. Because everyone now knows, right, the last couple of years we've been through, that one thing we want to do is we want to be as uh, uh, protective as possible against the uh, harms of the outside world, like a virus. But it could be a bacteria, and it doesn't have to be COVID, it could be actually uh, the flu. 
and we want to actually just remain healthier. And so, um, you know, it used to be, you know, grandma was saying, just have your chicken soup. Now we know that there are some specific foods that can actually boost our immunity. Uh, uh, and, I, and I think that the other thing is that, uh, uh, that I'm super excited by is that part of the immune story has to do with gut health. When our gut isn't healthy, our immune system isn't healthy either. When our gut is healthy, it really props up our immune system. So this idea of healthy gut, healthy immunity, uh, healthy circulation, uh, faster healing uh, is really amazing. And on the horizon, something I'm really, really, uh, I think is just um, aspirational is to look at what the future will hold for foods that can help our body regenerate faster. We already know there's a lot of foods that can do this um, and help uh, push our body's stem cells along faster. But imagine being able to find foods and combine foods and cook foods that actually help our bodies deliberately regenerate. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, very cool. Um, what's the worst thing you've ever done for your own health? Um, you know, I remember when I was in medical school, uh, so this is going back a few years, uh, you know, you're, you're trapped for four years, basically inside a building, uh, and you're learning and you're stressed and you're not sleeping. Uh, uh, and the hospital cafeteria had nothing but the grill and fried foods. And you'd be up late at night grabbing snacks. You know, this is four years of your life. Yeah. And to do that, not get enough sleep and eat junk for four years. That's pretty devastating. Now, I was lucky because I had did my gap year before I went to medical school. So I would often choose not to do that. But that combination of being surrounded by poor food um, and not getting enough sleep, that's really bad for your health. And ironically, that's what happens to all the people that are being trained to be doctors. Well, that is kind of nuts, right? I mean, geez, you'd think we'd figure that out, but yeah, crazy. Okay, my last question for you, my favorite question I ask everyone, but what's something about you that most people don't know? Most people don't know that I actually um, like to cook. I really like to cook. Um, when I was in Italy and in Greece, I spent time in kitchens cooking, uh, shopping at the market and putting together. And I, I actually learned from people who are chefs um, how to put meals together. Uh, and, and there's nothing like, you know, learning how to cook Italian food in Italy yeah. from Italians that do it home style. And, and that's something I've never forgotten. So, um, you know, People want to come over to my house and I'll fix them something to eat. Usually, it's usually a crowd pleaser. I love it. This is awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining. Let's remind everyone where they can find you and follow along for your free masterclass. And you do have another book coming out. So we look forward to that. But give everyone a little reminder. Yeah. So you can find, uh, find me uh, on uh, the web uh, at uh, www.drdrwilliam.com lee spelled l-i dot com dr william lee dot com i'm on social my handles at dr william lee uh and uh um you know sign up for my newsletter because it's a free newsletter i release new information and new research that's coming out and it's my way of kind of getting people out there and the master class uh you can actually find on my website as, as well it's free completely free sign up it's part of my fun to be able to uh, and part of my mission, frankly, to be able to take new research that I'm doing and other people are doing and communicate it uh, to the world. So I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, engaging people at that level. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you, Morgan. Okay, bye-bye.